Hi everyone, Mike here from Bikes by Mike with another cycling related video. This is the fifth and final episode I'll be doing on the Haute Route Pyrenees 5-Day Cycling Sportif. My first episode was on course design and race format. The second one was on my Haute Route training plan. The fourth one was on cycling nutrition, supplements and fueling. My last one was on bike maintenance and bike travel cases. And now this final episode will be on my race experience and post-race wrap-up. Okay, so let's get to it. So I feel it's been years leading up to the Oat Route, but really it's only been eight months. Race week has come and gone, and now it's time to wrap this all up. I'll cut to the chase. The race was fantastic, like near perfect. Exceeded my expectations in almost every way. I say almost as there's just a few things I would have done differently. More on that later. I'll break down each stage and show you my favorite moments of the race, and I'll wrap up with some advice on important things to consider should you wish to tackle a stupidly mental event like this. Okay, first things first, how did I get there? For those of you fellow Canadians and Americans, your best bet is probably the same travel route as mine. It makes for a long travel day, but probably the best option given the lack of direct flights and infrequent service to some of the French regional airports. For my departing flight, I flew Air France from Toronto Pearson to Charles de Gaulle Airport. I had about a three hour layover in Paris before taking a flight from Paris to Bordeaux. I waited about six hours before catching the two hour Haute Route bus shuttle to Biarritz, where the Haute Route Registration Event Village was located. The race finished in the small town of saint larry soulon While Haute Route offered a bus shuttle service back to our starting point in Biarritz, I chose a more direct route by taking a private shuttle from saint larry soulon to Toulouse Airport, which was a two hour drive. I took a flight from Toulouse to Paris, and after a two hour layover, took a flight from Paris back to home in Toronto. My friend Michel warned me, and I will warn you, that labor strikes are quite common in France during the summer. Typically, they come suddenly with no notice. Sure enough, the baggage handlers at Charles de Gaulle went on strike the day before my departure, which affected about 20% of the flights into and out of Paris. Fortunately for me, none of my flights were delayed and my baggage arrived just fine. But one of the guys I met at the airport wasn't so lucky. His bike never arrived. The 2002 Oru Pyrenees is a five-day stage race starting in saint jean pied de port along the Atlantic Ocean coastline and border to Spain and finishes further east in the town of saint larry soulon the race route is 617 kilometers long, 15,700 meters of elevation gain, and 14 categorized climbs. Stage one started in the town of saint jean pierre de port and finished in the ski town of Formigal on the Spanish side of the Pyrenees. On paper, stage one looked to be the toughest of all days, being 154 kilometers long with 3,700 meters of vertical gain. While there are three climbs on this stage, the Col de Portelet was the most brutal, being 26 kilometers long with 1,251 meters of vertical gain. While not particularly steep with an average grade of just 4.5%, there were several sustained sections over 6.5%. It is the length of the climb that makes this one difficult. Everyone was relaxed and fresh as we headed out with a neutralized start and before we hit the first climb of the Col de Landerie. We had a bit of fog which quickly burned off in the day and we had beautiful clear skies when we hit the top of the Col de Portelet. I felt good all day but tactically I could have been better. I wasted too much time at the feed station on top of Col Bargargui, loading up on gels and bars and looking for a pump to add air to a slow leaking back tire. That meant that when I hit the flatlands at the bottom of the descent I had already lost touch base with a large fast group that would have been useful to get me to the base of the Portelet. A good day, anyways. Live and learn. I don't know what to say. I have no words for today. It was brutal, it was madness. But it's also beautiful and totally epic. I'll never forget it. Stage one, 154 kilometers and 3,700 meters of climbing, 
finishing here for my gal. For my gal. Which is beautiful. So the Vent Village is here, hotels are up there. Time for a massage, which will be the best part of the day. Eat and recover. Let's see what happens. Stage two started in Formigal and finished in Pau. Everyone was excited to tackle stage two as all three climbs are featured in this year's stage 18 of the Tour de France. But for the reasons I'll get to shortly, it was a relatively short climb up the Col de Portelet that was to be the only significant climb for the day. It was a cold and wet start to the stage, but with only a one kilometer neutralized start, things heated up quickly. We started with a short five and a half kilometer climb up Col de Portelet but at a fast pace. I looked down at my Garmin and saw that I had to hold 300 watts just to stay with my group. Ugh. The descent down the Portelet was fun, but a bit sketchy as it started to rain heavily and visibility was limited. Many riders took cover under trees in the valley before the start of the climb up the bisque. About a third of the way up, there was a bit of confusion as we were stopped by the Oat Root official who announced that the organization had made the decision to cancel the stage. Conditions off the top of the Obisque were said to be treacherous. Not what we wanted, but definitely the right decision. As it turns out, this was the shortest stage in Oat Root history. Stage 3 was another epic day which began in Pau and finished in the town of Tab. As with previous two stages, the profile for this stage was daunting. 161 kilometers in length with 3,300 meters of climbing. Two big climbs for the day with the appetizer being the Col de Salois and the main dish, the mighty Col de Tourmalet. I'd ridden the Tourmalet virtually several times on this cycling app, not this one. So I knew what to expect. So important to say something for the last one and a half kilometers where the grades remain steady at 10%. While the climb is officially 17 kilometers long, you actually begin to ascend 10 kilometers earlier after you descend off the back of the Col de Salois. The Tourmalet first appeared in the Tour de France in 1910 and it has appeared since then on 80 occasions. It is one of the highest peaks in the Pyrenees and one of the most legendary climbs in cycling. On his first appearance in the Tour, stage winner Octave Lopez is famously quoted as having yelled, Vous des assons, oui, des assons. He called the organizers murderers for the severity of the race. I think a lot of us were thinking the same, particularly as we faced a stiff headwind on the way up. It was brutally hard, but the good news is that the climb up is as beautiful as the view from the peak. Stage four, we started in Tab and finished at the top of Cap de Long. Today was a contrast in climbs. The first climb, Orque de Saison, is a famous climb well known by cyclists and appears in this year's stage 17 of the Tour de France. The second climb, Cap de Long, is off the radar for most cyclists, myself included. I'd never heard of it before this race. It is 22 kilometers long with 1,315 meters of climbing. While it is not severely steep with an average grade of just 5.9%, it does have a tough two kilometer section with ramps over 9%. Physically, this was a bad day for me. I woke up with stiff and tired legs that stayed with me the entire day. From kilometer zero to the base of the climb up De Saison is 30 kilometers of rollers. To avoid the mistake I made on stage one, my strategy was stay with a large, fast group up to the base of the first climb and then climbed the mountain at my own pace. It was full gas from the start where a large lead group formed. There was a split about 10 kilometers in where some riders couldn't follow the wheels in front. My legs were screaming in pain, but I was able to bridge a gap of about 200 meters to reconnect with the lead group and stayed with them until the base of the first climb. Mission accomplished. For me, this stage was the most stunning of them all. Lush landscapes, lots of wildlife, and the only people we saw were our fellow Uut cyclists completely unspoiled natural beauty. Mountain ranges and mountainous regions all have their unique character. Certainly the Pyrenees Mountains look and feel much different than the Alps or the Dolomites. But even for us here in the French Pyrenees, this particular area felt different than the rest. More isolated and less tracked by people. 
extremely quiet. I remember mentioning to the American cyclist riding next to me that you could literally hear a pin drop. There was something very uniquely contrasting about the zen-like environment we're in and the aggressiveness of the race. I always come back from epic cycling trips with specific moments in time etched into my brain. And for me, for the Oatroot Pyrenees, this was one of them. Stage five, the last day of the race. We started in the center of town in saint larry soulon with the stage finish at the top of Col de Porte. The vibe seemed different today, kind of chilled. I think everyone was pretty tired at this point and also kind of sad knowing that the race will be over in a few hours. But the calmness would end quickly. I know that many riders, me included, kind of dismissed this stage at first, thinking that it'd be easier than the rest being only 69 kilometers long. But with 2,800 meters of climbing, it was brutal and probably the most challenging stage of them all. The race organizers knew what they were doing. The more I thought about the Col de Porte, the more concern I got. 16.2 kilometers in length with 1,315 meters of vertical gain and an average grade of 8.6%. That is 1% higher average grade than the infamous Col de Tourmalet. The only sections of the climb below 7% grade was this one, and this one. For me, this was definitely going to be the hardest climb in the stage. Just like on stage two, the neutralized start was short and then it was full gas up the first climb called Dezet. Again, to stay with the fast group, I had to push 280 or 300 watts. I was spent when I reached the top, but happy to stop at the feed station to replenish myself. With the 32 cassette on my rear hub, I was in the drops and out of the saddle for most of the climb up the Col de Porte. The temperature climbed to 40 degrees Celsius at one point and I had to get off my bike and duck my head under a roadside fountain just to cool off a bit. Actually, I had to do that twice. But with the pain came some of the most beautiful landscape, wildlife and mountain scenery one will ever see. Gorgeous. And then it was over. Haute route Pyrenees et finite. And here are the final podium places in the GC and team classifications. Ilnar Zakarin, a pro World Tour rider who just recently announced his retirement, came in 10th place. That'll give you a sense of the quality of riders in the field. So how did it go for me? I'm happy with my results. I went in hoping for a middle of the pack finish and that's where I ended up. There were 316 starters, of which 64 riders either abandoned the race or didn't make the time cut. I finished in 152nd place out of 252 finishers. And really, based on the form I came into the race with, I don't think I could have done much better. Maybe I could have moved up a few spots if I had better strategy going into stage one, but I could have easily dropped in the rankings if I had one or more really miserable days. Except for my one off day on stage four, I felt pretty good all week. Okay, as a newbie to this, I learned a lot about what to do and what not to do to succeed at an oat route race. And I will do a lot of things differently for my next race. So here now are my top five tips for other newbies to bring out your best at an event like this. Number one, have a training plan. That doesn't mean you need to hire a coach or follow a meticulous training plan. Maybe that's for you, maybe not. But well in advance of the race, like at least six months out, you need to figure out what volume and intensity of workouts you need to complete to be race ready. I saw riders of all abilities at Oat Route, and the one thing they all had in common is that they came prepared. Nobody was dumb enough to show up thinking, uh, I'm just gonna wing it. Didn't happen. Number two. Have a race strategy. You need to work out a race plan before each stage, not while you're racing. Karsten, you out there? I learned this from you. Each stage will be different and you need to think about how to maximize your strengths during the race. If you're a weak descender, maybe you'll do everything possible to crest the peak before the group you want to ride with at the bottom. I didn't have a good plan for stage one and wasted time because of it. Live and learn. Number three. Pace yourself. 
You can't approach a multi-day race the same way you would a single day race. Go in the red for too long or too often and you simply won't recover well enough to perform well the next day. Those few minutes you gain by going super deep can be lost 10 times over if you don't recover properly. Also, remember that sleep is the best form of recovery. Something I didn't get enough of. Number four, be organized. There are a lot of logistics to work out before and after the stages to prepare for next day's race. Moving to a different hotel each day means you'll be spending a lot of time packing and unpacking. Even if you're not changing hotels, you'll need to pack for the next day's race and make sure you put stuff in the right pack. Choices include your main luggage, your backpack, or your race pack. Three packs. It sounds easy, it's not. After racing all day, getting massaged, eating lunch and dinner, uh, making your way from the event village to your hotel, and then tuning your bike, it'll be time for bed. The more time you waste, the less time for sleep. I underestimate the logistical challenges of the race, more so than the actual race itself. Lastly, number five, have a backup to your backup plan. Have three times as much of anything that is essential. I thought I had enough tubeless tire plugs, I didn't. I thought I had enough sealant, I didn't. Tires, mm, barely. I was so meticulous planning my nutrition and then I stupidly miscalculated the amount of energy drink I needed and came up well short. If everything goes perfectly well, the race will still be tough. If you have complications and don't have a quick way to resolve them, the stress will hurt your performance or make it less enjoyable. Come prepared. So that is it. My experience racing the Haute Route Pyrenees Cyclosportif. Would I do it again? Oh yeah. I'm already thinking about the Haute Route Dolomites five day race. If any of you have done the Dolomites, please pass along your advice. I'll need it. I hope some of this has been helpful. If you have any questions or comments, please pass them along. That's all I got for today, folks. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up and share it with your friends. If you're not a subscriber to this channel, please subscribe as it allows me to produce more content for all of you. See you next time. Happy rolling.